Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic This Week in WordPress and Tech. This is episode 660. We've got some great stories. We've got a great panel. I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Let's start with the ladies. Let's start with Heather the Unicorn. Heather, would you like to introduce yourself to the tribe? Uh, yeah, hi. I am Heather Waldrenzi. I am the CTO of The Difference, and I am in sunny Las Vegas, Real where nice. Adele is not right now. No, she's so upset, Aww. but she's always upset, isn't she? Um, Stephanie, would you <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself to the tribe? In I would love voice. to. Thank you. <laughs> that's, how, that's the only, that's my Adele impression, because I can't sing. So I just imitate her talking like that. Uh, I'm Stephanie Hudson. I'm Stephanie Hudson. <laughs> I run Focus WP, where we help agencies to scale by outsourcing. And it is North Carolina winter here, which is shockingly covered in snow. It's been snow and rain for a week, so I'm oh, jealous yeah. of the sunny shocking. Vegas weather. Shocking. We've got one of our favorite guests and a friend of mine, Chris Badger, the outdoor man. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Chris from Lifter LMS, which is a learning management system for WordPress. And up here in Maine, it is also snowy in wintertime. So yeah. <clears> that <throat> looks good. It does. I got oh my, my God, I need one of those. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I need one of those. Uh, uh, <laughs> can you say one of those to me? Uh, uh, um, I don't know what to say. Um, Spencer. Spence, uh, would you like to introduce <laughs> yourself? This is Spence from WPLaunchFi.com. I need a costume too now. Yeah, I'm, uh -oh, I'm, yeah, I'm jealous. I'm jealous there. Uh, I've got my close friend, John. John Locke, would you like to introduce yourself? John from Lockdown SEO, straight out the 916 in Sacramento, California. That's right. Act down. And I've got the only Andrew Palmer. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself to the tribe? Hello, tribe. Uh, and if you're wondering what we were laughing at, is that Heather Renz, who we called a unicorn, has now got a unicorn onesie on, which is just ridiculous we're on the on the video. You can't see it on podcasting. But I'm Andrew Palmer, Sorry. Bertha, twin, Bertha dot AI and co-host of this lovely podcast. And I'm all, I'm 24 miles west of London, UK, and it's about three degrees centigrade. Mm. So this week in weather, otherwise. And when are you going to buy? I do expect a costume. You'll be wearing a costume next week, Andrew. Whatever you like, darling. No problem. Oh, I, I, I would imagine that's not the only time you've heard that said to you. No. Nope. Uh, um, but be, before, <laughs> before we go into our great stories, I've got a message from our major sponsor. I'll be back in a few moments. We're coming back. I also like to point out, Tribe, that Castor's got a fantastic offer, exclusive offer just for the Tribe. Plus, there's some other amazing offers and recommendations. And to find all that, you go to the WP Tonic slash recommendations and you'll be able to get that special offer and all the other goodies that are on that page. So let's go straight into it. Uh, um, no, don't take it off, Heather. Uh, I, I think you should wear it. You've got to wear it now for the whole week. <laughs> uh, um, so into the first story, WooCommerce aims to produce MVP for custom tables and orders. What did you think of this one, Spencer? There's a couple... <clears throat> excuse me, I lost my voice. There's a couple pet projects at WooCommerce that have been... I don't know, sous vide cooking for years now, including some of these things. There's also the, the WooCommerce Blocks plugin. Um, some of the conversation I've seen in the in the developers area there, and I've tried to put my two cents in, is like, why doesn't somebody grab a hold of this whole thing and shake it and make it happen fast or whatever? The difficulty with all of these things is that there are a lot of people that WooCommerce had acquired their software and now those are plugins, but those people are not given necessarily the authority to take charge of all these little pet projects. So what happens is 
it's the backyard barbecue thing all over again, where there's 15 opinions about something that could have been decided by one person and so on. And then it takes forever. And this is an ongoing conversation for me, but I'm saying the private market will figure this out and somebody will have a tables version of this as a private plugin long before this ever hits the reality of WooCommerce. Oh, wow. So, and by the way, that's not a criticism of WooCommerce because WooCommerce at its core, Mike Jolly and the team are like all over that. But when you talk to them about why don't we add this feature in, you get the same response like, because we're busy enough with the core feature stuff, we don't want to be annoyed by more add-ons and stuff. Right now. So, Stephanie, what do you think of this? Um, I don't care. You don't care. Oh, well, all right, then. off we go. Uh, on to the <laughs> next one. <laughs> um, Chris, what did you think of this thing, Chris? The WooCommerce thing or the next story? The WooCommerce. Um, I somewhat agree with Spencer. It's a little odd to me that um, you know WooCommerce itself hasn't embraced the block editor yet. Yeah. So uh, especially having it under the roof of Automatic, I would expect things to be moving a little faster. However, I know as a product company, Sometimes there's other priorities, and that's 100% okay. Um, I'm as a non-developer, I don't know the details of what's going on with the order table. But as somebody who's very much involved in the e-commerce space, uh, when you get into the weeds, especially on large sites with big data and lots of orders, lots of e-commerce activity, having that uh, order data optimized is super important. So it seems like a priority, and it's exciting to see they're cleaning that up. But I'd like to see the, um, I would personally like to see the block editor being able to be used in products. It would be handy. Um, there's always a reason for these story choices panel. I know you're amazed to hear that. The One of the reasons why I chose this story was that, um, it, to put it as Chris has so diplomatically put, the kind of slow development of WooCommerce <laughs> to some degree. Um, I'm very puzzled. Well, not puzzled. I mean, this is a very this is a very geeky concept. Like no person on the front end ever needs to think or know about this. This is like scaling large WooCommerce database optimization discussions. I mean, they might as well be talking about paint drying in the bathroom, but it's at the heart hence of my, why, hence my comments on right. This. But it's at the heart of why. WooCommerce is maybe not looked at like Shopify or like maybe some of the other enterprise level software in the past is that people have a preconceived notion that WooCommerce can't scale or it's not secure or it's not whatever. So there's no like pol political back and forth, but it's like geek, geek people going back and forth over crud versus this versus that. It's like most people don't care how their Tesla runs as long as it runs. You know. All right, then. So shall we go on to the next story, then? If you, well, the panel's shaking their head. They've got no interest in this. Well, I, I would I'll listen. just add this. The reason yeah. why they're doing it is is specifically so they can compete with Shopify. Yeah. Um, I'm working on a large site right now that's WooCommerce, um, and I had pulled in some additional help, and that's exactly the reason. Um, Shopify has more endpoints that are open for talking to integrating with other systems and WooCommerce does not. The whole creation of the custom uh, table is to pull it out of posts and WP post and WP post meta. But anyway, yeah, that it is to scale it. Yeah. Right. Then. On to story two, the biggest story in tech this week, Microsoft is buying Blizzard um, for six, some loose change, 68.7 billion. So have a, uh, um, the CEO of Blizzard is a bit of a has a slight reputation, Mr. Cotton, hasn't he? Um, uh, um, their share price, because of to some extent his activities and lawsuits, has been hit hard, hasn't it? Um, but what do you yeah. think of it? Uh, what do you think of this purchase or proposed purchase, Heather? Well, uh, so many people may not realize, I mean, like my uh, LinkedIn credits go back quite a bit, my IMDB credits too, um, but I have developed a couple of games for Activision and I, like a lot of my friends have um, worked for Blizzard over the years and it is quite the toxic environment. 
uh, there. <laughs> like, seems I mean, to be. He seems to be such a charming individual. Yeah, no, m most people there like only last like three or four years. Um, like you, you, Blizzard isn't a career, uh, and Microsoft isn't much better. Um, I mean, like, uh, I mean, not even. I, I mean, I, my uncle actually worked at Microsoft for uh, like twenty five years. Uh, but like I, I haven't heard many people <laughs> that have a similar story. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a marriage of two toxic companies. Uh, I don't think it's going to hurt anybody. Um, the thing that I'm most concerned about is, uh, I mean, I think this is going to give Microsoft a platform play more into Steam and uh, PlayStation. So I think they're going to rather than be locked down totally into the xbox platform um they're trying to open up more into uh oculus into um playstation like they're they're trying to do what they used to do um and go back into like we're not just a hardware company anymore we're a software company and uh we're platform agnostic so well, that that's what i see with this it also is a kind of play you know um, business to consumer, isn't it? You know, they 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 haven't got much traction with in the kind of and it it make put it this way, Heather. It might, to me it makes more sense, even though the price I still think is a bit rich. Um, but they've got plenty of loose change, Microsoft, don't they? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think. I mean, I think that uh, the the oeuvre of things that uh, Activision Blizzard has. And um, their IP is definitely worth it. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, you've got Halo, you've got Warcraft, you've got uh, Candy Crush. You've got, I mean, like, they've got things across the board that that are very valuable properties. Um, so, like, I mean, forget the employees that work there. There's always going to be people that want to work at Blizzard. There's always going to be people that want to work at Microsoft. I've got a friend right now that is living in his car in Redmond just hoping to, I mean, like going to coffee shops every day, hoping to network with people so he can work at Microsoft someday. Um, like, I mean, he just like moved across the country to just hope that somebody will hire him. Um, and this is not an unusual story. So um, these are companies that people want to work for. So it doesn't matter how toxic they are. People, like they look good on your resume. Yeah. So what do you reckon, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I think what Heather says is that the the assets they have, the IP that they have, is massive. I'm interested to hear what games um, Heather built. That would be good. Um, maybe I'll hear that in the future at some stage. But the point is, is games... I think it must have unicorns in it. <laughs> no? Oh, dear. Yeah, game, gaming's massive. We don't understand... You know, my teenage daughter is playing games all the time is either on xbox or on something else or world of warcraft i don't know where it you know whatever um and they cost a lot of money you know it's 34 quid and then there's updates and upgrades and you know another fiver here another tenner there and it's just in these companies are worth a fortune what i'm what i think is this is another if you don't want to build it buy it Right, so this is this is a, a GoDaddy Pagely situation. If you don't, if you can't build it, buy it, and that's what that's what Microsoft have suddenly realised, and they've said, right, we've been a bit tunnel vision about what we're doing, and we need to need to revert back to what we were, which is platform agnostic, and we can do that by buying these guys. And sixty eight billion to us is a cup of tea. So let's go and do it, and, and yeah. let's build on that. Andrew, do you think it's because they've got AI stuff going on there? I'm yeah, wondering I think, if that's got something to do with it to to sort of so. keep that direction going. Yeah, I think that's right. And also, you know, Web3, whatever you care to call it, or, you know, the the whole Oculus situation and the um, metaverse, everyone's rushing. There's a few other acquisitions out there as well, Heather, I think, aren't there, that are people are buying buying up stuff that they can get into this metaverse. Because we mean, so it's, a to, it's a way to kill two birds with one stone. You've got the CEO who is hiding 700 reports or I don't know what he's, he's doing some non CEO like things to bury Mr. Kotick about the, my voice said it, about the problems they're having. So the best solution is you got the metaverse coming up. You got all this litigation on the front. You got 700 angry employees. Why don't we just take our money, call it a day, throw it into the Microsoft pot and let their attorneys sort it out. 
ta da. You know, ta-da. before so, we end up on the front page of People Magazine. Yeah, they were seemingly they were touting it for a few months. Microsoft wasn't their first. I mean, choice, but the money, you know, the other people. Billion is a rounding error to Microsoft. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, it mm. does make sense. It makes more sense than what they've done with LinkedIn, which, um, which isn't much, as far as I can tell. They've done bugger all with uh, LinkedIn. Oh, no, they'll uh, be they'll be building a LinkedIn metaverse. Have no have no fear, and this is just oh. the first step. I think they make I think they make automatic look fast movers. Uh, um, so, so Chris, so Chris, um, what do you reckon about this? It makes some kind of sense, doesn't it? It does. I think it's. I think the overarching theme here, for, especially for big tech, is it's a survival strategy to stay relevant. I mean, we're always going to use spreadsheets and the Microsoft suite in some way, but doubling down on gaming. I think a, a lot of people don't realize how big it is when it comes to things like metaverse, cryptocurrency, NFTs. These things, the gaming part of that is massive, and we're just going to see an explosion of that in 2022. In-app currencies, people moving, digital assets between games. Um, so it just makes sense for one of our tech giants to make sure that's in the portfolio. Yeah, esports is massive. I mean, we've got... Um... The, the golf club that I was a member of, the, the managing director of the of the the golf club, was actually is the chairman of um, UK Esports, um, and they're just putting on a, a massive live event of people playing games in a football stadium. <laughs> you know, so it's it's that's forty thousand people sitting in a football stadium playing games. I mean, it's just crazy. It's a crazy world, and the prize is three million pounds for the winner. So, Heather, do do you think they're going to have any problems with antitrust, or do you think do you think? Uh, I mean, Facebook and Google are already facing antitrust uh, suits right now. Um, Microsoft has dealt with them in the past and has ways around it. So, I mean, like, I don't mean like that they're uh, skirting the law. I mean, like, Microsoft is very good at um, uh, not rubbing up against antitrust laws. So. Um, like well, the, I, these senators are really cheap, aren't they? No, no, no. I mean, I think they know, like, they're they're not going to like roll everything into Microsoft. They're good at keeping things as separate businesses run by separate CEOs, um, kind of like Warren Buffett. Like Warren Buffett buys companies and lets them run independently. So um, that's, I mean, that's the way to do it, and that's the way Microsoft has done it. So um, I don't think they're going to run into an antitrust issue. No. So, John, what do you reckon? Does, I think it kind of makes some sense, and it's just a loose change for Microsoft, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is di- directly because of the the metaverse. I, I feel, and they're they're also trying to compete with Sony. I mean, Sony has PlayStation, Xbox is, you know, th- they have that platform which they're trying to. Um, keep going they could definitely roll some of this stuff into xbox live if they wanted to but i i think that's the play it makes sense to um acquire something like this if you run um a video game console uh company it makes sense to acquire something like this like they do with minecraft you're acquiring um you know the user base as well mm-hmm. So makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah. All right then. On to story three. Um, let's let's hope this is a better choice of WordPress story. Uh, what you need to know about WordPress five point nine. So what do you reckon about this one, Spencer? Um, you know, I've jumped on a lot of the bandwagons. Of, you know, the the Gutenberg in particular, but Cadence is one of those things. I also jumped on at the same time. And I do feel the cadence represents one of several, but certainly one of the leaders in helping do exactly what I was just referring to, which is to provide the bridge to the thing that ultimately will be in WordPress, right? And so this is a really, really Mm. well-written post by the, I think he's the owner, if not something else, but, you know, the founder, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like, I couldn't have written this better myself to explain all the nuances of what's going on, not the least of which is he makes it clear, don't don't get too excited too fast because this is basically a WordPress experiment 
but we'll stick with you to make this transition smooth through cadence which is exactly the kind of stuff that people want and need to know, that it's safe to move forward, but there's going to be somebody that's going to take you to Tomorrowland today, and then WordPress will maybe catch up as soon as they get that stuff together. So okay, I, I really got, enjoy I just, it. I just got to make a comment about this, actually, because the way that Spencer was speaking, he was speaking like Christopher Walken and giving this all kind of this Walken dedicated kind of just really did my head in then. Is Walken from Chicago or something or what? What's going on? Who, me? Yeah. It's like you sounded like Christopher Walken when you were, were talking about Cadence. It was crazy. It's like, you you anyway. mean like, like the target in the future? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Just like, stop, anyway. stop drinking the whiskey. Uh, so many exactly. celebrities on today. I had, uh, <laughs> I, had, I, I had too many calls before this call, and it's, it seems to have taken my voice away. But yeah, there in any event, I there do like go. the article. It's moved into a little bit like Forrest Gump almost, though. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh, I know what love is. That, oh, oh, we don't want to know. Um, Chris, Chris, uh, what do you reckon about this, Chris? I like Ben's approach, the founder of Cadence. Um, it reminds me of the rollout of Gutenberg, how at first it was kind of a plug-in. You know, it was like separate, but it's coming and you could play around with it. It seems like they're moving a little faster here with the theme, uh, full site editing deal. They're not, it's less of a like gradual rollout. So I think there is going to be a little bit of whiplash in the market, particularly from theme creators. But uh, at the end of the day, sometimes you have to rip the band-aid off and just move forward. But the, it'll, it'll cause a spiral of new innovation and theme creation that where things are full site editing compatible and certain plugins and themes will be disrupted who provided similar functionality in the way that Gutenberg kind of took from the uh, page builder market share. This is going to take like Cadence already has features to manipulate the menu and the footer and stuff like that. So this uh 5.9 is kind of taking some of that innovation that some themes had and just rolling it into the core which at the end of the day i think is healthy and it creates opportunities for themes to move forward and continue to innovate in other ways so so heather you know in my, in the wp tonic newsletter which i i hope all the panel have signed up for and they receive a copy of i'll be deeply disappointed if they haven't uh, um you know i remarked in the newsletter last week that um you know i think the in page editor really needs to be more love before you go on to full editing but i do understand the logic because i think this is driven by the need to be more competitive when it comes to wordpress.com which is grossly uncompetitive at the present moment What's your views on that, Heather? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard. I mean, like if people are used to for the past however long, because WordPress has taken so long to do this, to going to widgets or to another place to get to the footer and then the header and the all over the place, they're not going to be, uh, they're not, it, it's going to have to be a complete retrain. And whenever you have to completely re-educate people on how to do something, it, it's it's going to take a while for adoption um, and they haven't done a good job or the, historically WordPress hasn't done a good job <laughs> with uh, training people on like this is a new new tool this is how you do something um, so I mean it's gonna we have to wait and see to see how people are going to use this because it it, it isn't it isn't uh, intuitive Yes, that's one way to put it. So, John, what do you reckon? Yeah, full site editing dropping um, in a few days, you know, beta full site editing. I, I think what um, is interesting too, like Matt said uh, very recently that they need, what was it, 50, they said 50,000 block themes in the um, repository, which I don't think that's going to happen this time around. No. Uh, but that's that's the next step is basically being able to register as uh, a theme, uh, just put in some blocks and creating a block theme. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. You know, hopefully uh, it does really good. 
and uh, it's it's definitely getting closer. So yeah, um, yeah. excited. I, I, I think that five thousand thing is worth talking about because Sally mentioned and she's not here. But yeah. The, the problem with that conversation, that note that Matt dropped, is that that is the difference between his reality and the rest of our reality. We can use metaphors, but we don't need 50,000 custom made, or sorry, 5,000, he said, custom made themes. What we need is something like Cadence is doing, even if there's more than one of them, that everybody can make stuff for that is agnostic to anybody necessarily mm -hmm. owning it because otherwise we're gonna just keep repeating the same thing. Like wh why do we need 5,000 sandwich makers? We need 5,000 ingredients that can all you work on one sandwich, but we need one standard sandwich. And that's the part that when you go to Wix and Weebly and Shopify, they don't have this problem. They're like, you know. And, it's and like, Stephanie, Stephanie, I'm frustrated, <laughs> Stephanie. You know, you? Uh, I, I, yes. Uh, How uh, can I help? Uh, oh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, um, I, I see all the possibilities. I see, you know, all the possibilities that um, Spencer sees, all the opportunities. But I just, just think it's all been done in a bit of a, not in a great way, really. I, and I'm frustrated. Can you help, Stephanie? <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out why this is only 5.9. Like, doesn't this seem like a big deal? What are they? What else do they have coming? This seems like a big deal. This is like the full site editing, even if it's just beta. I just, I find that like I'm, I'm stuck on the number. I don't know that. Like, I think that's weird. Like, I'm trying to figure out the mindset of that. Is it because they don't view this as a major thing? You know, that's not a major release, but it feels like the beginning of something major or something they've been talking about for a really long time. I don't know. So I don't know if I can help you with your frustrations because I'm. You're not the only lady that says that to me, Stephanie. <laughs> no, that, that's so that behave you know. yourself, host. Behave yourself. All right. Uh, uh, I want a word. Yeah, go on. Nobody's mentioned the customizer or the lack thereof. <laughs> well, that was that. That's a whole. That's a whole other story. Developers love the customizer. You know, it's gone. Ta -da. I don't. You look and at that thing, that picture in that article with it shows the sidebar there, what was the customizer, and it's like actually something useful. Like that's exciting. The customizer is such a pain in the neck right now because you have to go in there and do things, but it's just it's like a completely another a different it's, world it's than where you're actually. It's so coding. interesting because Ash, the people from Ashta, great, great crowd, and but that, that's the only thing with the Ashta theme. They really tried to embed a lot of it with the customer customizer oh um, no they're they're getting rid of the customizer yeah, they're getting rid of it. and it never really worked mm -hmm. Every, everybody that's like everybody that's tried to do something with that look at old matt medeus was it composer matt medeus from um um the matt report they he he tried to make a big play and put it all in there and, and it didn't pay off uh, um, it's like so file can... cabinets in the old days when you used to have a file drawer with the big folder and the little folder and the little folder. It sounds great. And then if you don't actually make that like your absolute every detail in the right spot, you find after a week or a month, you can't find anything because there's so many places to look for it. So you got the controls on the right side, then you got the admin bar, then the customizer and the customizer stuff. And it's like you're in 80 places. We need just like, hello, one thing at the top or the right that everybody goes to for all of the administrative design yeah. controls. It definitely needs some UX love, doesn't it? How's, so, this, gonna, how's this gonna affect um, LMSs, Chris? Could you have your say on this? I mean, I, I mean, you're, because you basically use, for want of a better phrase, you basically use the classic editor, right, in LMS. It's just a, it's just a... Oh, it's cool. We got lots of blocks. So we we were early adopter of Gutenberg and a lot of the course components have been broken right. into uh, blocks. And I'll, I'll say something which I haven't shared publicly here before is uh, we're, we're actually uh, in the works of our own uh, full site editing compatible theme that LMS sites can use that just embraces the future of wor where WordPress is going. So uh, that's something that's there, there you are, Tribe exclusive. <laughs> there we go. We're going to go for our break. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. 
we're coming back. We had an exclusive in the first half. <laughs> uh, um, so if, if you really want to support the show and become really part of the tribe, join us on the WP Tonic Mastermind Facebook group page, Facebook group page. Um, Spencer, some of the other panellists post regularly on there. Got any questions, Andrew will answer them. I will chirp in a bit more regularly. I've been having a little bit of a break, but I have become re-energised, tribe. So, on to the next story. Oh, God. <laughs> um, this is a delicious story. Uh, I've got a guilty secret, tribe. I, I do listen to the All In podcast. It's like a guilty secret, but I can't resist it on my little walks in the morning. I listen to these three, these four geezers. Um to say they feel that they're self-righteous would be an understatement, but there we go. Uh, um, they got when they got into a bit of a trouble, you know. I thought I would never defend Jason, um, who I feel is a really self-righteous prick, but uh, um, I got to I got to defend Jason, uh, um, but because some of his panelist members make him look like a bleeding liberal. Um, however, um, what, what did you? make of this story and um some of the remarks in this great podcast uh so uh, this is the one about the uyghurs sorry the, yes yeah. yeah so i mean this is a really tough call i mean i, I don't think we should be the world police is one yeah. issue um and i you and i agree on that <laughs> But, I mean, it is a human rights issue. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I don't... I was having a discussion with my husband the other day uh, where um, a friend of his may or may not... Uh, a friend of his is in the early stages of a potential uh, sexual abuse scandal where, like, he has been accused, but nobody knows if it is like if it's true or not and he's in the he doesn't know if he should come out uh, on the side of his friend um or say anything and i was like i don't know what you do either because like it is like you if you say if you come out for your friend right now and then it turns out he did this thing then like it, that could affect you for the rest of your life. But if you don't come out for your friend and it turns out he didn't, then that could affect you for the rest of your life too. So with, with a humanitarian matter like this, like, so, I mean, there's a backlash against him now because we think we know what China has done, <laughs> but we, mm. I mean, it comes back to we're not the world police, and that's the only thing I can say. Yeah, the, I, I totally understand where you come from, but there's the difference between trying to be, be the world police and really coming out with a, a load of excuses well, and no, no, But or, no, I mean, but that's the thing. It's like if you if you say something about these things, then no matter what, people are going to take it against you because, like, we don't know what the actual situation is because China isn't saying anything and, and we're taking the side of the Uyghurs because we think we know what's happening, but we don't know what's happening. We really don't. We are only taking the side of the reporters and the Uyghurs and the, but we can't even say that because we're assuming things that we don't know. So it, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Yeah, What's the sure. issue that we're talking about here, though? Is it what's going on to this group of people? Or is it that what, what he said. said something terrible, which is, here's the quote. Let's be honest. Nobody, nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs, OK? You bring it up because you really care. And I think that's really nice that you care. But the rest of us don't care. I'm just telling you a very hard truth. So that's the quote. That's what we're talking about here, right? Is that yeah. is that he said that. and And I think kind of what you're saying, Heather, is like, just shut up like just don't like why would you say that like if that's not your issue and you're not directly involved in helping those people like just don't get involved then like yeah don't say that is kind of what it is right because yeah like we care but like 
It doesn't okay. affect none you. Of in, none of us in this room want to see horrible mistreatment of any human beings, right? But like, how is he using this? Like, nobody cares, right? Like, but do we care? Like, do do we care? Like, are we get going and getting involved and demonstrating that this is a thing for us, right? So, so yeah, I I see like from the outside, like it's completely ridiculous that he said those words because that's horrible from a human. But everything, rights. yeah, everything is also this taken out of context. Like, but what does he really mean by that? Does he really mean like, hey, I think it's great that this group of people is being completely, you know, I don't, I don't know. I see what you're saying, too. I don't know enough about this guy at all to be able to say, like, in any way what I think he might be thinking by saying that. Can but... I tell you the truth? The thing that fascinates, because it is very complicated and there's multifacets about this, but the thing that interests me about the podcast, it's become, because obviously I'm interested in podcast panel because I run three of them, right? Um, so it would be of interest to me, and it's a. I do enjoy listening to this train wreck of a podcast that's become really very, very popular. I think it's in the top one hundred now of podcasts, and I think it gets about two million listeners per episode. Right? Um, what really interests me, panel, is these four and. I'm going to butcher his question. And Car- how do you pronounce the gentleman's Karmesh? Karmesh? Jamath he- Polyhapatia. All right. Thank you. Uh, um, he's a, he's, he has been stated as being a billionaire. I never even heard of the geezer. And he's a billionaire. Um, and, you know, I've heard of David Sachs because I, I really don't like David. You know, I, I really, really find him obnoxious. Uh, um, um, but these four geezers, they're all VCs. They, they've made a ton of money. And I just feel that because they've made a ton of money, they feel that they've got some real insight about anything. And what I see is four, what, four VCs that have been pretty lucky and they feel they're so self-righteous about their views. You know, I find it nauseating part of me. But so, John, what did you reckon about all this, John? Yeah, so um, the guy in question, he's a 10% minority owner in the Golden State Warriors. They already made a statement trying to distance themselves from this because they realize how it looks. Um, you know, it's 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 interesting what you said, Heather, Um I, I think there is some truth that um, a lot of people don't care a, about whether it's the 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 Muslims in um, China, whether it's the genocides uh, enabled by Facebook in in Myanmar. Um, it's it's interesting when we say we shouldn't be the world police because we ourselves commit a lot of war crimes against other places uh, where we go in and have wars that are over uh, illegitimate reasons. And we cause a lot of the problems that, that, that I've seen throughout my lifetime, whether it's in, you know, Colombia or El Salvador, or Iraq or Afghanistan. But, you know, these rich guys, rich guys, billionaire rich people, they really don't care about anything except for maintaining their power when it all comes down to it. But I think the average person out there, the average person in the United States, um, I would say that they are upset about this issue uh, because right now they're being told like China is bad and that taps into uh, their need to demonize uh, another group, kind of like the Russians were the enemy in the 80s. Now it's the Chinese. Um, but we don't even care about the things that we do to other Americans. Um, we've done tons of things, whether it was uh, slavery, genocide of the American Indians, uh, whether it was putting Japanese in internment camps and dropping bombs on Nagasaki. We've done plenty of things, you know, that other people, other countries could have stepped in and stopped the U.S. from being monsters. And I I think that that's an uncomfortable truth that we have to sit with sometimes, too, that it's not just China or Russia or these other places. 
it's us as well. Yeah, but I think I think the I, I think you're totally right. But I think the main difference is in in this country we can have this discussion. If you were in Russia or China, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We wouldn't be allowed to have this discussion. And if we tried to have this discussion online, we would be in prison. The, you know, there would be the three o'clock knock on the door. Okay, uh, then. The, it, it, Okay, yeah, you say that, but at the same time, you see all these states uh, that are trying to pass laws to keep teachers from teaching the actual real American history. I'm not saying country. that, John. I'm not saying that, John. You're absolutely right. Yeah, but it's still, we, John, it's still the we, fact that if you try to have one line, aren't we one line away from making a comment that would make us the next Julian Assange? Because all Julian Assange was doing was exposing truth, right? That's my view. We are all guilty. France, Spain, Germany, Italy, Portugal, the whole of the European um, uh, continent, Africa, America, we are all guilty of genocide. We have all of our countries in, in our militaries have committed genocide through some form or another at some time in our history, right? So what what we've got to do, and what I agree with Heather, and I also agree with John, it's a tough thing to do. We cannot be the world's police. What we can be is the world's advocates, right? So we can say, don't do this. If you do this, we will do this. We no, won't necessarily go to war with you because I'm completely against war of yeah, any sure. kind. But we will take political stands and we will take um, injunctions against you to, to stop you doing that because we will, we will affect the way your country runs. So that we can be advocates, but we can't, we can't control other people's countries' political systems. That is up to the people. And if you say that I'm talking silly now, look at the French Re Revolution. Look at, look at the USSR. It's, so, not, it's the people have the power at yeah. the end of the day. So, Spencer, you, know, some, uh, you have a business leader that's really benefited from technology and globalization. And his position is, um, I don't care what's happening in a, one a country that's a, that he probably has invested <clears throat> and some of his companies invest in. So he has a totally blinkered, if it doesn't happen in America, I don't really care. But he's a, a chief member of, the, of those that benefited the most from globalization. So... I found it a very um, bizarre view. Anyway, what's your own thoughts? First of all, I, I, I'm a fan of what Jason Calcanis does, and some of his shows are entertaining. But I also think you have to view him and his guests in the in the reality of the bubble they live in, of, mm. of self-made maybe, but still entitlement, or at least sitting on a high mountain looking at the rest of us or the rest of the world. And that comes through here because the one thing that strikes true to me about this is that this is a historically factual statement. Those that have, those that feel they are in power, say very, very different things publicly than they say in private amongst themselves. This should be a surprise to no one. The king from the 12th century did not talk publicly about the things he talked to within his court or her court or whatever. So the point is, this guy was lazy or stupid or just lost his mind for a moment and said something without realizing he's not on a private phone call with Jason and the rest of the country club boys. And it got out. And there's dozens of examples of this happening in today's world. Some of them are legacies, like the whole Epstein matter, where all those pieces are coming public. But this stuff, Harvey Weinstein, all this happens all the time. I'm misogynistic. I'm a, I'm a monster. I'm a fascist. I, you know, let's make a deal to murder these employees because they're not working fast enough. That stuff is like mainstream for people with money and power. End of conversation. I don't think it's surprising, but I do think that the guy should pay the price because you're a moron if you're in that position and you have a little podcast and say something that careless would be the best word. Because look at the backlash he's going to get for having to having agreed to be on Jason's little podcast. So that's why in, 
I'm not saying it's even in the same era, but like, remember last year we had all those discussions about what we should or shouldn't say here. I think all of us have learned that maybe one day we'll pay the price for things we said last year. And it's better to just knock it off now before it comes back to haunt us, because there's always going to be people that are going to be hurt by things that are said publicly. And you have to weigh out whether it's worth the, the price of doing that. Well, I think you, you had every right to say what he wanted to say. I just find it. Illogical. I don't think he would. I don't think he would miss a beat to take it back if he was given a, you know, a time machine. Cause no, this is I think he was him. just being brutally honest in a way, but I'm just, just find the mindset bizarre, but I think he was just being honest. Do you really think though that these guys, I mean, honestly, in private conversation, when they talk about the employees of the companies they fund, and we just talked about Activision and Microsoft and so on and so forth. Do you think that Blizzard or any of these other people, do you think they really care about their employees like some other CEOs do who have done things demonstrably to say, this is really what I'm saying and what I'm going to do? These are people that care about money and power and prestige. And they don't look at other people, even ironically coming from nothing. Once he's made it to the like top, yeah. it's like, I forgot where I came from. He's a self-made man. Um, so Chris, what, like I say, the thing that, the thing I got from it is that um, I think these four don't understand how lucky they've been and how they should get on their bended knees and just thank God for the luck that's come their way. I think they overestimate their skill and underestimate the amount of luck that's been involved in getting them where they are. What do you feel, Chris? I'm also a walker on my Saturday morning walk. I listen to the All In podcast. To give a little background on Chamath, if you're not familiar with him, he's a Sri Lankan immigrant who was raised in uh, who moved to Canada. His family was very poor. They used mm -hmm. the social services yeah. a lot, and ultimately he ended up in Silicon Valley, like you said, uh, at the right time, right place, the right people. And he also worked really hard and, yeah. and became very successful in tech and investing. I think his comment was, uh, in some ways, what he meant to say is it's not my, that's not like a, a priority in my field of vision right now. But it, it came off as like, when he said nobody cares, I think he, he kind of, it wasn't quite what he meant. Um, I know he does have compassion. I agree with you that that particular set of panelists are very high confidence. They're very, um, they're very opinionated in what they're saying. And, and in the background, they also have a political agenda in terms of what they're trying to influence and make happen and various political arenas. Um, but to, to them to acknowledge their fortune of, uh, there is a lot of hard work and, and stuff that happened there. I, I can't speak to them. I don't know them personally enough to, to, really know for sure like a level of arrogance there but at the end of the day i think this is sort of like a test of cancel culture and how it plays out i think he made a mistake and uh um you know and i think he's gonna get i don't think he's gonna get chamath is not gonna get canceled but i think they're all gonna be a little more guarded now in terms of what they say specifically in regards to other cultures or groups of people one of the fascinating things about chamath particularly is he's such a beneficiary of more of the left liberal agenda yet he has ended up kind of as a business professional very much kind of on the right he will talk down to things in his words like woke liberal media politicians and stuff like that so I find his view somewhat fascinating in that he's somewhat of a contradiction, but um, at the same time, I think he has a good good heart, and uh, I think this quote was a misstep. But I think the reaction of you know the 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 team and whoever felt they needed to distance from him, I, I understand why they did that, and I hope we can actually look at this situation and grow from it, um, and not have just like this hard. Um, cancel cu culture moment where somebody doesn't get a second chance. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I think we leave it at that. We're going to go into the recommenda recommendations now. Um, 
So um, let's start with Andrew, because I think he's got a special recommendation, hasn't he? It's, I'm holding this up to the camera for podcast people, but it's Birth of a Unicorn by uh, Heather Wilde at the time, but we know her as Heather Wilde. Please put, that, please put the hat back on, Heather. So this is uh, one of the best books I have read in the last... Um, I gotta get, I gotta get one of those. Do you? Do, and, 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 recommending a book. You bet, Angie. Do you think it would suit me? Andrew? So there's a link. Shush, John. There's a link in, um, in the thing. But basically, it's uh, Heather's time at Evernote <laughs> and other companies and how she got the job. But also, it's about romance, adventure, and living and working remotely in different countries and traveling around and um, nearly falling off a mountain and cats and stuff like that so it's a lovely 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 story and i highly recommend it and it's called birth of a unicorn and there'll be a link in the show notes as well i really highly recommend it all right stephanie have you got a recommendation for the tribe i do i've been using um blinkist lately i signed up for that it's um the one of those uh services that gives you the short version of books my list is so long of the books i want to read and i have so many started books in my uh audible i'm an audiobook person so i love the being able to just listen and for some of these there's some books that i am interested in but i don't know and it's great to be able to have just a quick 15 minute summary of the book and then uh, decide if i want to buy it and read the whole thing or if i just get the gist from that so uh, I've also used Read It For Me, which is another service that does a similar thing. Um, they're both good. Blinkist is less expensive. It's only about eight or nine bucks a month. So that's mine for this week. Right. Put, put in all your recommendations in Slack and Uncle Spencer will double check and help me out as well. I'm, I've, got a, I've, got my own recommend, I've got my own recommendation and that is Barn to, from Barn 2. It's the Document Library Pro if you need frequently asked questions section or document sections, especially if, if you're using Chris's great product, um, it's a great add-on plugin, and um, we've been using it on a couple of projects, and we love it. So, um, Chris, have you got a recommendation for the tribe? I do. It's what's behind me here. I'm going to be a little self-promotional today, but it's actually about a hosting company called Cloudways. And what they've done is they've uh, created, they've innovated in a way to help people get started without even putting a credit card on file. So they, with us as an example, they partnered. So they created a site that's already set up, has all our premium software installed, and people can try it out, try out their hosting, try out our learning management system without a credit card for three days. And if they want to keep either the hosting or the LMS or both, people can just move move forward. So I think that's a great innovation in the hosting pa space instead of the situation where you get in, you figure out you don't like well, it. I and don't think they're the it. only people. I know some other companies do some <laughs> interesting things as well, but there we go. Uh, um, <laughs> right. Um, Heather, Heather, have you got a recommendation for the tribe? Yeah. Uh, very sad news when I woke up this morning that uh, Meatloaf had passed away. Um, so I actually got to know Meatloaf, a friend of mine was his manager for a while. And, um, so, uh, I, my recommendation is a, uh, a documentary that was done, um, in 2007, um, for his, uh, Bat Out of Hell Revival tour. Um, uh, it's a really good documentary. Um, it is, uh, oh gosh, what is it called again? Um, I sent the link for it. Um, but it is called, um, I, I have it on DVD. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, meatloaf in search of paradise. I so, have it on DVD. Oh, it is such a great, uh, yeah. uh, so if you didn't know meatloaf's, uh, songs, if you didn't know anything about him, he was very interesting, very nice, uh, man. And, um, did, wasn't the best singer. Uh, don't expect him to be, have an awesome voice, but, um, he invented operatic rock. Indeed. Um, John, have you got recommendation for the tribe? Yeah, also RIP to Louis Anderson, also died. Yeah. In um, Vegas today. Yeah, crazy. Um, my recommendation is uh, for a Twitter account, James M. William 18. Now, this man, uh, each day he shares 
uh, threads about things that you might not have known about American history. It's I've learned a ton, uh, very thorough threads, and uh, you'll learn a lot. So please go follow uh, James M. William 18. Right. Thank you, panel. I think it's been an excellent show. I think we covered some interesting topics, apart from my first my first story, which went down with went down with the panel like the Titanic. But you know, you just gotta accept these things. The panel are harsh oh, sometimes, beloved tribe. You we'll see you it. next week with another great round table panel and a great discussion. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.